All right, we're going to get started on day six. I do that every time. We're going to get started on day six notes. We're going to be going over 2.8 today, which is a lot of work with the reciprocal function of the reciprocal family. Um, reciprocal is a math word that you hear all the time. It always shows up when we're talking about fractions. We talk about multiply by the opposite reciprocal, right? That would be how you could find the, or I guess multiply. Opposite reciprocal would be how you find the perpendicular, the slope of a perpendicular line or the gradient of a perpendicular line. We could multiply by the reciprocal if instead of dividing by fractions. So reciprocal is a fraction word y equals 1 over x. That's our generic, that would be called the parent function, the most boring reciprocal function. And reciprocal is one of the most complex of these very boring parent functions. So reciprocal, if we were to use our calculator, if we were to type this in, it would be a graph that kind of looks like this. Now, of course, you have calculators, and hopefully you've seen this before. Um, make sure that this arrow looks like it's going more or less straight to the side. Let's make sure that this line makes, you know, looks more or less like it's going straight to the side, that this one looks like it's going straight up, and that this one looks like it's going straight down. And the reason that we have that strange behavior for this graph is that we have asymptotes. In fact, we have two different asymptotes. We have a horizontal asymptote in addition to a vertical asymptote. And that has kind of chopped our graph into four quadrants which has ended us up like this. Now, this is just a parent function, just like all the others. Last time I saw you on Friday, we did some work talking about parent functions of transformations. We did that thing with the car, which again, I understand is kind of silly, but it always works for me. If we wanted to kind of relate this to that, the A would go on the top with the one, that's where our vertical stretches and compressions would go. That's where a lot of times the negative would end up for any of our flips over the x-axis. Then we're gonna have h in there, possibly with the x. That's where we would get our horizontal shift. And then we're gonna get, of course, our plus or minus k afterwards. That's where we get our vertical shift. Again, hopefully that feels pretty comfortable. That's nothing new, no, no, no big surprises there. Something we already talked about on Friday. Now the reason we're spending our, our own day here is because this format is a little funky and because asymptotes, and we're gonna really talk about asymptotes and, and how those asymptotes work. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the vertical asymptote. Make sure you get the little sneaky P in there for asymptote. And the vertical asymptote of any function, the, the easiest way to find vertical asymptotes, if you ever hear a question that says, tell me the vertical asymptote, it is most likely going to be, where is the bottom equal to zero? Of course, if you want to be fancy, that would be the denominator. If you could spell denominator. That's where the denominator is equal to zero. And that comes up, of course, for this uh, reciprocal family because, yeah, we got an x in the bottom. It's gonna have most likely some place where that bottom does become zero, which is gonna create a vertical asymptote. And we're gonna have a little bit of a problem. Now, we're gonna introduce today something brand new. And we're gonna kind of be skipping ahead a little bit here all the way to 5.1. We're gonna have a little bit of a sneak peek into 5.1. And topic five is calculus. 
feel like we need a light on. Is it better to have maybe the light on you guys so that you don't have to look at the light? It's just on there. Um, I feel like the rainy day makes us all feel a little sleepy, so I feel like we need a light on. All right, we're going to have a little sneak peek, and we're going to talk limits. This is brand new. I swear, I don't care who you are if you're smart to get in class. This is probably something you've never seen before. If you're feeling like, oh, another lesson where Mr. Collier talks about something I already know, I'm sorry. This is brand new, I promise. So limits, here we go. Your limit is your expected value, which is different from typical math where we deal with not your expected value, but your actual value. So your limits is how we can introduce some questions that don't really make normally good math questions, but now we can kind of rephrase them. So our limits, you're gonna write it like this, the lim, we're gonna leave off the it because we're boring math, and not boring, we're lazy mathematicians who don't like to write that in part because it's a waste of our time. We're just gonna write the lim. And then of course, normally we're gonna have some sort of function that's gonna follow that, the lim, of f of x, because we can type. And that's going to give us some sort of answer. It's our expected value, so it could be a, a 1, or it could be a 2, or it could be a 10, or it could be an infinity, or it could be something. But right now, this doesn't make a lot of sense as a question, given the information I've given you so far. The expected value, the, the expected value of f of x, like, so if, if, if f of x looks like this, and I just say, what's the expected value? You're like, what do you mean the expected value? It's just a line. The, the expected value of what? So limits has to come with one more clarification. Underneath the word limit is going to be an x and an arrow. And this is going to be x is approaches 2p's or 1p? What do we got on here? Quick, Google it. Math teacher tries this, but do you guys not know approach? 1p, 2p? 2p. All right, we're in good shape. X approaches. I don't know if it just looks so weird because my p's are hideous or not, but we'll see. So X approaches, and then here's going to be a number. So we'll just put C as, as a placeholder constant. And so now this makes more sense. So think about it now, given this example, for our line f of x, maybe I should label it f of x. Here's our x value c right here. And what is the expected value as x approaches c? Do you expect it to be a or b or d? B. It's not, it's not hard, actually. In fact, it's kind of a dumb question still. It's like, yeah, it, it looks like it's going to be, looks like it's going to be B. And that, that's it. That's all limits are. Limits are just asking you, what do you think it's going to be? And especially when we have super easy graphs, the answer is always exactly what you knew it was going to be, right? There's, there's no real surprises here. So how are we going to incorporate limits, which seems very, very easy with our asymptotes? So let's look at a question here. Let me give you a graph. Let's call this one g of x. And let's, let's give it a nice horizontal asymptote. How about y equals 1? Let's go for a nice, oh, it can't be all the way over there. Let's put it over here. A nice vertical asymptote x equals negative 1. Let's see our graph looks like this. So, so far we would know how to say, okay, where is the asymptote? And you could tell me the asymptote is at x equals negative 1. And where is the horizontal? Okay, the horizontal is at y equals 1. But we haven't really had a way to talk about what is happening around those asymptotes. Like, 
Does it look like it's going up? Does it look like it's going down? Sometimes we could say like, oh, it's decreasing and that could give us a little bit of an expectation. But what we can do is we can ask the question now, what is the limit as X goes to infinity? What that's asking, G of X, is as X is going towards infinity, what do you expect it to be? That would be as we walk this way, so when we are all the way over here, where do you think the y value is going to be? It's, it's 1. And basically, the limit thing already handles the word approaching. So you don't have to, do, you don't have to include the approaching. You just put 1. The limit as you're approaching that is, is 1. And Devin's made a, a very good job of being careful He's saying, I don't really want to say one because we have the asymptote and it's, it's not going to be one. It's going to be 1.0001. But all of this limit apparatus here allows us to just say it's one, right? It's like you just kind of shrug your shoulders and you say, it's going to be one, dude. Get over it. So we could say the same thing. What is the limit of G of X as the X approaches negative infinity? So as, as x goes this way, when I get all the way over here, I, I feel like now, again, I'm kind of wasting my time. 1, right? This is going to 1. It's going to keep heading towards 1. It looks like it's going to 1. It is going to 1. It's going to be 1. So limits are from 5.1, which is calculus, but Limits are not bad, right? It is literally just a way for you to talk about asymptotes a little bit better. Now, here's where limits, this was so, so, so super easy. Here's where it could get a little bit ugly all of a sudden. What if the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x? So now we're talking, what is the expected value as we approach negative 1? So what we're looking for is in this middle region, as we get closer and closer and closer and closer, and we're getting closer and closer to negative 1, what do you think the y value should be? And here's where it's like really funky. Part of me think it's going to be down here in this negative infinity region. Part of me thinks that's where the graph's going to be. The other part of me is thinking the graph's going to be up here in this positive infinity region because it's going up. And so as we are approaching, Devin, why don't you stand up and do a demonstration? Are you cool with that? Go stand by the chair over there. All right. Devin, we're going to walk together and do a high five in the middle. You ready? We're going to walk forward. As we're approaching each other, all right? Now pause. I think... The graph from my side is about to head down. And I'm starting to look down to follow the graph. And as Devin is approaching, he's doing the opposite. He's starting to look up. And that is a disagreement. Even though we're looking at the same place, the two different sides have two different opinions. We cool on that? All right, let's do this, dude. That was sharp. OK, limits. Still not too bad, right? That's all I needed you for. But you did a great job. The limit as we go here is does not exist because we just don't agree with each other. So we came up with this whole thing, limits, because they allowed us to talk about asymptotes, pause, and then it just didn't work right away. It was the any. Why was it undefined? Undefined versus does not exist? Basically, limits, limits in general, we just use do, does not exist for both. Undefined verse does not exist doesn't matter all that much, I would say, as far as like which one are you allowed to say undefined. I, I, I would say they're more or less the same. But particularly for limits, what we're going to talk about now, the real question, as I've just run out of 
board space. I don't quite know. I'm just going to do it like this. Is that we're going to introduce the limit as x goes to negative 1 minus. And the limit as x goes to negative 1 plus. So what we're going to talk about now, and this is the last we'll talk about limits here. We want to use limits so that we can talk about our asymptotes. We can use limit goes to infinity, and guess what? It's just going to be the horizontal asymptote, because that horizontal asymptote is just absorbing the, the graph towards it, and you're going to get that. And as we go towards the left, as we go towards negative infinity, it's still going to be just the horizontal asymptote. But at the vertical asymptote for this question, we, we do have a problem. Because I was looking down at the ground, and Devin was looking up at the sky, and we, we basically did not agree, so we did not exist. But we still, we want a way to talk about the asymptote, and so we have to get even more specific and talk about the limit as x goes to negative 1, negative, and the limit as x goes to negative 1, positive. So these are superscripts, just like exponents. And maybe my handwriting isn't super good. On your paper, it would look like this. Limit as x goes to negative 1. And then it's hard because this is already small. A little floating negative sign or a little floating positive sign. So it's attached to the 1. It's floating up like an exponent. And it's either a positive or a negative. And what it means is either you're going to approach from the left or you're going to approach from the right. This is just my point of view versus Devin's point of view. So my point of view from the left is that I think we're going to be down at negative infinity. Devin's point of view as he approached from the right is going to be positive infinity. And we're both correct. The whole limit right here Bringing it back to your question, Devin, about does not exist. In order for a limit to exist, both sides have to agree, which almost always happens, except for when you have an asymptote, they don't do a very good job agreeing. And so we just say it does not exist. OK. So if it was like a hole, just like a hole, would you have a point that does not exist? We are very much creeping more than a sneak peek to 5.1, and we're just doing 5.1 now. But that is a, a, a very clever uh, assumption or a very clever way to kind of continue to ask questions. No reason to write notes on this, because we'll be doing that um, in 12 months. But 5.1, we have a line. We have a hole. We're right here. The thing about limits is it's just your expected value. And so the thing about limits, oh wow, it's a giant eraser. Not what I expected, sorry. So the thing about limits is we don't really care about holes. Because holes are the, the true value at C right now. You know, f of C is, does not exist or undefined, however you want to say it. But as far as limits are concerned, as I'm approaching, it looks like it's going to be A. And as far as you're approaching from this side, looks like it's going to be A. So even for this graph, the limit as x approaches C would be A. And again, we need some sort of f of x jammed in there. But yeah. But that is literally what the cal that's what HL2 and, H and SL2 were doing for the first day of school this year, because they were doing calculus. OK. Let's go back. Now, all that is pretty easy. Let's say we have k of x is equal to 1 over x minus 2 plus 3. And I want to know, what is the vertical asymptote? Somebody shout out the vertical asymptote. What is it? No. You got to give me a whole thing. 2 is not good enough because the asymptote is a line. Yes. Vertical asymptote is your line at x equals 2. Because think about this. What happens if x equals 2? What happens? <laughs> Divide by 0, we all die. Right? So that's how we can tell vertical asymptote is x equals 2. Now, I could ask you questions like, 
what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side? Well, wait a second. We want to have a graph here. It looks like it's shifted up 3 and right 2. We're going towards 2 from the positive side. Our graph did not get flipped, so it still looks like this. And 2 from the positive side, Devin's looking up. It's going to be infinity. Limit as x goes to 2 from the negative side of k of x. Mr. Collier disagrees. He's thinking it's going to be negative infinity. So we just did a whole question in like 30 seconds here. Is this OK? Again, it is a big detour to introduce how limits look and how they work, but not too bad. Again, make sure you know that the plus is from the right side, which is kind of common sense because this is where all the positive numbers are. And the minus is the left side. That's where all the negative numbers are. So it's, it's probably common sense that that's the case. OK. Now, what happens if, why, why are we doing a whole day on reciprocals? And obviously, limits is in, like new, but it's not hard by any means, is we can be out of vertex form. Again, if you're thinking to yourself, all right, he's been talking for 30 minutes. He's been talking for only 21. That's not too bad. He's been talking for 21 minutes, and I'm getting bored. Here we go. Bring it back. Give me a good five minutes, and I'll be done. If we have y equals fraction x plus 5 over x plus 2, this is not something that we can think about the transformations of. This is not a reciprocal family function. This is just a normal function of two things that are divided. It is going to look pretty much like a reciprocal if we type it in our calculator, if we type it in Desmos. But our H's and K's and A's have been ruined, right? If I said, how does this compare to Y equals 1 over X? Tell me the transformations that took us from here to here. Eh, right? I mean, is it, there's not really supposed to be an X on the top. And, and what do we do with this plus 5, right? That's different than the plus 5 that comes afterwards. And it's definitely not the H that's down with the, so. This is a little bit of a problem. Probably the only thing that we're learning today mathematically that's really going to make you think and do some algebra here is this. What do you do when you're out of vertex form? So this equation right here is the same exact thing as this equation. And so if, if we wanted to talk transformations of this original, we could say, what is the transformations? Or what, what is transform? Where's the R? Transformation. Are we going left, right, up, or down? Give it to me quick so I trust that you know what you're doing. This one, where are you going? Left, right, up, down? Left, two. Are we going up or down? Up one, of course. And there's one more thing that we need to do for this function to transform it around. Yes, we need to do a particularly a vertical, because we've talked about both horizontal and vertical shift. We talked about a vertical stretch by a scale of 3. So we need to shift it left two and up one, and we just stretch it three. And when we look at this, okay, maybe I see where the two is coming from, because that, that denominator didn't change. But a, a, a transformation of one and a vertical stretch of three, I really did not see that coming from up here, looking at this. So how can we do this using no calculator, just our brain? How can we go from this and get it into that. 
We got any idea? Have we ever done this before? Let, let's try that for just a sec and let's see where it takes us because I don't think it will take very long, but x plus 2, x plus 2, x plus 2, x plus 5. You want to FOIL that? Or you just want to cross it out? Because it, surely it's not crossing it out because otherwise we put them there and got rid of them. So if we FOIL that... If you did an x minus 2 like that, if we did an x minus 2 and then we foiled it, that would create an x squared minus 4, which I don't think is really that useful because, again, we're working with 3s, 1s, 2s, and 4s. And it. You have some, some good ideas because we need to clearly be working with fraction skills that we've used before. Here's how I want you to think about it. This is all one fraction. It's all, one, it's all jammed together. And this is two fractions where we've spread them apart. And I know that this one is just a nice one, but it, this one is also a fraction. Okay. Basically what we've done is we've taken and we've made something like, you know how you can have five halves? And you know how like when you're in third grade, or maybe even like fifth grade or something, they might, hey, take this five halves and write it like this. And now that's hideous. Like we hate that now that we're in calculus and IB math. But you guys familiar with this process? Because you've got two holes that you can kind of pull out and leave behind that stuff. So that is the process that we're going to do, right? We've basically taken out one whole piece. So how does that look? I'm going to think about this. Let me grab it a little bit. Maybe make it a little bigger. I'm going to think about this x plus 2 that's in the bottom. And so when I set this up, x plus 2, all of these top x's, I need to get rid of all of those top x's so that I don't have any more x's in the top, right? This is x free. So if I want to grab one x, this x right here, if I want to grab this and get rid of it, then I'm going to look to set up stuff like this, x plus 2 over x plus 2, because that will cross out and get rid of it. So what I'm going to do is I have one x. I'm going to put that x. And then this 5, I'm going to spread out into two different parts, into a plus 2 part and a plus 3 part, because plus 2 and plus 3 is still 5. I've spread it out. And now this, that part is looking very much like a 1. And this is my 3. So there's my 1 and my 3. That's where those two numbers have come from. Now, don't do this. That is, is bad math. Don't just scratch those out. What we need to do is Think about splitting up our fraction into two parts. So, oh, less of a long line, please. There we go. Split it up into two parts where we're going to make sure this part is divided by that and this part is divided by that. And now you're allowed to cross those out. And now you're allowed to see that anything divided by itself is 1. So then you have y equals 1 plus 3 over x plus 2. OK. If you didn't write that down, sorry. How can we get this into this is the the very last thing on the notes, how do we get this into nice vertex form where we can straight up take this and say, here's my asymptote, here's my this. Look at the bottom. 
that's your x plus 5. Then look at the top and take all those x's and make however many clones of the bottom you need in the top. So here's what I'm talking about. y equals x plus 5. For every one of these x's, I need to make an x plus 5. So if I have two x's up in the numerator, then I'm going to need 2x plus 10. Is that a random number, or do you know where it came from? I mean, that's right, but you, I, need, I need a little bit of feedback here. I don't know if it's because it's a rainy day or because of the weekend or what. Do we know where this thing came from? Thumbs up? Or, okay. I appreciate your honesty. We're looking at the denominator with its x plus 5, and that is what we need to chop stuff into. And what we're trying to do is make a whole number to add on to it. If we want to make a whole number, we need to have the same numerator and the same denominator. So now, by looking at the denominator, we're trying to repackage the top into doubles or triples or quadruples of the bottom. So two x's we want to get rid of, and we need that to be in the form of the bottom. That's why we need to choose plus 10 because that will make it double what the denominator is. Now, what we just did is illegal for now, because you cannot just take a negative 1 and transmute it into a, negative, into a positive 10. You're not allowed to change numbers in a math problem, so you have to be balanced. What number needs to go in this position to keep the equation what it should have been before? Minus 11. Nice job. Minus 11. What is 10 minus 11? The negative 1 that we need before. So this is our perfect setup, right? We've done some like real math teacher brainy moves here where we've said, hmm, the only way for me to maneuver the numerator is by thinking about the denominator making doubles or triples of the denominator. We had to make a double, because there was two x's. So we had to make a double. So we took our negative 1, and we made it a 10 and a negative 11. Now we can spread this fraction out, and we can make this fraction two fractions, one of them with the perfect stuff, 2x plus 10 one of them with the ugly leftovers, negative 11. And of course, they both have the same denominator, plus 5 and plus 5. So now we're in business because this is just a nice whole number. What is 2x plus 10 divided by x plus 5? 2. Two. And, if, and if you need proof, do GCF. It looks like this. Now it's just a 2. But anyways, y equals 2 minus 11 over x plus 5. So we've just shifted not vertex form into vertex form. And now that we're here, it has been shifted up 2. It has been shifted left 5. It has a vertical stretch of 11. Dang, that's a big number. And it has been that negative is in front. It's the a value. It has been flipped reflected over the x-axis. All right. Where's all the papers? Hopefully, on my end, that was actually difficult <laughs> because I feel like I've been standing up here and everything's been so easy that we've been frustrated. So maybe our brain has started to started to to grind a little bit. It should be one piece of paper each, so pass them back. These are questions that we're gonna do together, not homework. Questions we're gonna do together. PDF, boom, boom. Teaching, HL1, 
unit one. And this is day six. Oh no, I can't tell the difference between their name. This one. Oh. Import PDF. All right, look at that. So this first question, here we go. It says the graph of the function ax plus b is shown. It's also divided by x plus c. I chose this one because we had some ABC stuff on the quiz. We didn't like it too much. We said we didn't practice it. So here we go. Boom. A plus b plus c. Here's our function. Find the values of a, b, and c. Um, I need to change my pen color to something I can see on both. Maybe this color. So a, b, and c. Now, we don't need to come up with all of these at the exact same instant. AX plus B divided by X plus C. Hmm. Now that is not our perfect form. That is not our perfect setup. That is not our standard kind of go to. So what if we started by figuring out our vertical asymptote, the C, because from all the work we did before, we never mess with the, the, the denominators. So C should be an easy thing to find. Who's got the C value? Is it positive 2 or is it negative 2? This is a vertical asymptote at negative 2, but of course those are always opposite. So you're right. We should have positive 2. C is equal to positive 2. Now we've got some other stuff here. AX plus B. I think it would be somewhat difficult to go through the whole process we just did if we were leaving in there A and B. I think that would be a little bit of a stretch for our brains right now. Can we think about maybe these nice points that they've given us here, which are 2 comma 0 and 0 comma negative 3? Can we think about those points to maybe help us out? Hmm. So if we plug in a 2, we should be getting the value of 0. So that means if I put a 2 here, and if I put a 2 here, we should be getting a value of 0. And the denominator, that makes it look like this. I think that should help us out a good bit as well, right? If we, if we plug it. What do you say? I'm, I'm just considering this point here, two zero, which means input of two gives you the output of zero. So I'm trying to think, I, I went ahead and I chose that two and I plugged that in. I'm trying to think about it like this. We, we decided that our x is going to be 2, and we also found that our c is 2. We knew c was 2 because c is our vertical asymptote number at negative 2. Multiply both sides by 4, subtract b the other side, sure. So that looks like a decent start, but we have a and b. Anytime you're working with a and b, we always want to develop this strategy of get two things going and use substitution or use elimination. I think substitution is way easier, but you guys like elimination, I guess. Now let's pivot and let's work with this other coordinate. If we input a zero, the output is a negative three. That should be even easier because inputting zero, everybody loves that. So now we're working with 
zero a plus b over zero plus two equals negative three. I don't even think we're gonna need substitution because now when we put in zero, zero a, that's gonna go away, zero plus two, that's gonna go away. b divided by two equals negative three. So what is b going to be? Nice job, negative six. This is definitely not a walk in the park, so that, that, that's a very solid pickup. And now, what is A going to be? This part's not very difficult. Negative B, which should be a positive 6, and 2A equals 6, so 3. We're choosing this that we started working with, which was ax plus b over x plus c. c was a pretty relatively easy find, because what number is going to make a vertical asymptote where the bottom equals 0? And that was happening at negative 2, so we chose positive 2. So we were able to switch c out permanently. This one above it? So then. We're considering these nice dots that they gave us. They gave us those solid dots on the piece of paper as definitive coordinates that we could use, one of them being 2, 0, one of them being 0, negative 3. They gave us the intercepts. And those intercepts are nice because, remember, the x is the input number, and then the y is the output number we should expect. So we did it in kind of two waves now. First, we did the, the more difficult one in a way. We chose to use this one first, which was input a 2, output a 0. So then, from right here, we put a 2 in all the x values, and we expected it to be 0. We input the 2, we output the 0. We did a little bit of maneuvering. We, we made that a 4, and then blah, 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 and we looked over here. And we simple, and that's how far we got. Now we got stuck because too many letters. So we started over, and we came back over here. This time we wanted to input the zero, and inputting zero is always easy because a times zero. Uh, you know, zero plus two. Who cares? It's going to be zero. Oh, input the zero. Output the negative three. I'm sorry, talking too fast. Trying to move on. This is on the video, so if you're still stuck, you're going to have to open up the video and watch it there. B. Find f of 4. OK, f of 4, that should be pretty easy. That just means plug in a 4. And we now know what a, b, and c is. So let's make our full equation. The a is 3, the b is negative 6, and the c is 2. So tell me what f of 4 is equal to 3 times 4 is 12, minus 6 is 6, 4 plus 2 is, OK, it's just going to be 1. Then it says, find the f inverse of 1. Oh my god, that's going to be so freaking hard, and it's only worth two marks? How are they asking us to do all this stuff? f and f inverses are just flip-flops, backwards. So if input 4, output a 1, the inverse, input a 1, output 4. So nice. No math, just a little bit of thinking, just a little bit of brain, we'll be all right. And c, by observing the graph, solve the inequality f of x less than or equal to 1. Hmm. Well, I'm going to need to observe the graph, so all this stuff needs to go away. Solve the inequality. Again, look at the marks. It's only worth two points, so we're not talking a whole big revolution here. f of x is less than or equal to 1. Okay, that means the y is less than or equal to 1. And here's my y value of 1 in this position right here. And so if it says solve the inequality, 
I'm just thinking where is y less than or equal to 1? Well, 4 is our you know, point where we reach that. And it's also going to be less than 1, 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 about that long. So for C, I'm thinking from negative 2, not included, just the less than, because that's the asymptote, we can't be that, x less than or equal to 4. Again, the question says solve the inequality where y is less than or equal to 1. And y is less than or equal to 1 only in this region. And that region is 4, negative 2. But make sure you do not put an equal sign there. So negative infinity is a y value, right? And It does. We need to observe the y values to state an x value. Our answer wants to be an x value. If we put negative infinity right here, that is an x value of negative infinity, which is over here. And our graph is above that y value if we go here. Yeah, so if it was range, we need to stop thinking about 4 and negative 2, and we need to rotate it and start thinking about it like 1 and negative infinity. You're right. So it, it, that's just the x and a y flip floppy kind of thing. Flip it over to the back. Two options here. We can keep going. We like this. Maybe, maybe this is making things worse. I'm not sure. We can keep going. We can look at this question here. Do it together. This question, as you can see, has to do with splitting up those fractions, which we did, which seemed like it wasn't our best thing ever. Or we'll just stop this. Maybe I can post you the key to these answers. And I can give you the homework so you can start the homework early. I know that's a little bit of a temptation both ways. Do we want the homework now, or do we want to look at number six? One vote homework. Homework. Homeworks? Okay. I will maybe give you the answer to this, and I'll give you the homework, and that will conclude notes for the day.